What's going on, Lakers fans? This is Jonathan Hernandez of the Lakers Legacy Podcast, coming to you with my first post-game recap of the season. So unfortunately, tonight the Lakers lost 115-103 to to the Detroit Pistons. Since starting off the season 3-0, the Lakers have now lost three out of their last four games. They are currently 1-3 on their road trip. And yeah, this was by far the most disappointing loss of the season given the context of the team that they were playing. The Detroit Pistons were 2-5 and five coming into tonight's game. They had just played a game yesterday, and it was the Lakers who were coming off of two full days of rest, and yet it looked like the Lakers were the ones who were gassed and outmatched in every athletic metric you want to use. So here are my quick post-game recap thoughts of tonight's loss. I'm going to kind of be all over the place, so bear with me. Um, no fun graphics and charts today, just straight stream of consciousness, instant recap style. Maybe one of these nights I'll go live and you guys can interact with me as I sort of give my raw thoughts on the game. Let me know if you guys would be down for that type of show. Um, but yeah... Uh, how and why did the Lakers lose? I will give you my top three takeaways from tonight's game. Yeah, I'm going to kind of look at my screen here to sort of help tell the tale of what happened. Um, and let's start with, let's start with my number one takeaway. And I think as we continue to go further and further along within this season and no changes to the roster are made, I'm going to sound like a parrot, unfortunately. And I'm going to start with the obvious. The Lakers have a clear athleticism deficit. They are coming into tonight's game. They were already one of the worst transition defense teams in the league. They were like bottom two or three in the league. They were like 29th in transition defense. And tonight the Lakers actually outscored the Pistons in transition 18 to 14, but it sure felt like the Pistons were the more aggressive team out on the break. But yeah, in general, through the course of a 48-minute game, the Lakers are getting pummeled by these teams with multiple faster guards and wings, teams with multiple athletic and physical forwards, and the Lakers just don't have the athleticism or dynamic explosiveness to compete. Not only in their backcourt, definitely in their backcourt, but LeBron James is almost 40 years old, Rui Hachimura's motor wanes here and there, Anthony Davis did not look particularly good on the defensive end tonight, even before he tweaked his ankle. Tonight was just a culmination of the Lakers just being pummeled by Detroit's athleticism and speed from Jaden Ivey, from Cade Cunningham, from Tobias Harris, from Jalen Duran and Isaiah Stewart. It looked like the, Laker, the Lakers just look old and, and slow. And yeah, I think the biggest difference was Anthony Davis did not look good defensively. He did not have juice in his legs and this was even before he aggravated his ankle case in point the lakers got out rebounded by 18 boards tonight and in the first half jalen duran already had 10 rebounds five offensive rebounds a lot of those on anthony davis and so yeah i mean anthony davis is already breaking down because he has to uphold not only the Lakers' defense, but apparently the offensive end as well. He had another 30-point game tonight. But I think what was clearly lacking from the Lakers' end was just their defensive fortitude and their ability to get rebounds. So yeah, that's one of my biggest takeaways for the Lakers in this early part of the season. When they face off against younger teams with fresh legs and more athletes, and if it becomes a track meet and the Lakers are not on their A game when it comes to offensive execution hitting their three-point shots, and most importantly, taking care of the ball, the Lakers are going to lose those types of games more oftentimes than not. Which is why I think it was wise for J.J. Redick to turn to Cam Reddish, which is something that I have been calling for if you guys watched my last video on the three things that can't keep happening for the Lakers to succeed. And in that video, I called for J.J. Redick to actually start giving Cam Reddish some rotation minutes. And the moment that Cam Reddish came into the game in both halves, the game sort of flipped on his head. And Cam Reddish tonight was the only Laker, I believe, who had a positive plus minus. Yeah, in a game where the Lakers lost by 12 points, Cam Reddish was a plus 10. That's insane. And he only played 14 minutes. But in those 14 minutes, you could feel Cam Reddish's presence on the defensive end of the floor. 
The moment Cam Reddish came in, he forced a turnover and got the Lakers leaking out into transition. He had a couple of other deflections, and in general, he was just doing a great job of mirroring and shadowing forwards like Cade Cunningham and then even some of the guards like Jaden Ivey, making life tougher for them to get their shots off. And then the other thing that I really appreciated from Cam Reddish tonight was just his rebounding. He had five rebounds, and a lot of them were of the forceful, emphatic variety. He really helped clean up some defensive possessions for the Lakers, and that's been one of the Lakers' biggest problems, just overall rebounding. Anthony Davis may get the stop, but the Lakers will give up an offensive rebound, and Cam Reddish definitely helped in that department. And again, to my point of the Lakers just having such a huge athleticism deficit, Cam Reddish is one of the players on this team who actually kind of levels the playing field when it comes to us having a more physical, toolsy athlete out there who can kind of stem the tide for us and not make things look so lopsided in the athleticism department. Okay, moving on to my second point of the night, and this is a point that I think we're going to have to keep on hammering throughout this season, and something that I've already sort of emphasized in prior videos, but number two, the bench scoring. Uh, we got another 22 combined minutes from Gabe Vincent and Max Christie, and they both winded up with zero points on the night. When it comes to overall bench scoring on the night, the Detroit Pistons outscored the Lakers bench 27 to 10, as the Lakers continue to be the absolute worst bench scoring team in the league. And even though these guys are being staggered with starters, they have been so bad offensively that it hasn't even mattered that there are guys like LeBron James and Austin Reeves or Anthony Davis and D'Angelo Russell next to these bench players. When these bench players come in, they are supposed to be the players who provide a spark and give our starters some relief and inject the game with some extra life and energy. And yet, so far through seven games, they have provided the exact opposite. If anything, they have been completely deflating to this team. It's become a situation where now we are just wondering if we can manage to stay afloat and not completely bleed out for the four or five minutes that... Anthony Davis has to leave the game. And yeah, I don't know what else to say about Max Christie and Gabe Vincent, but Max Christie has been so disappointing. He only got four minutes tonight, and that seems like four minutes too much, to be honest with you. Every time Max Christie gets the ball and has to do something with the ball and make a decision with the ball, I get supremely nervous. And if he has to take more than two or three dribbles, that's a turnover the other way. And he just has no confidence in his shot as well. And even when he's attacking closeouts and tries to go up strong for these finishes, he either ends up getting his shot rejected or he ends up tossing up a turnover and it just hasn't been pretty for Max Christie. And then Gabe Vincent. Don't even talk to me about Gabe Vincent. The $33 million man who the Lakers signed to three years guaranteed money. $11 million per year. We still have Gabe Vincent on for two more years at $11 million per year. And yet he is giving us 1.5 points per game type of production. Yes, he tries on defense and yes, he competes. But at the end of the day, he is a 6'2", 6'3", guard who most opposing players can shoot over. And if he's not giving us anything on the offensive end, what good is he? He played 18 minutes out there and gave us zero points. I don't even think he took a shot. Yeah, Gabe Vincent didn't take a single shot. He didn't have a single assist. Gabe Vincent can't consistently shoot. He's not a true point guard, so he can't really play make. He is too small to consistently be relied upon defensively. And then he also just has some of the worst shot selection that I've ever seen from a player. Somehow even worse than Dennis Schroeder, who can at least drive it into the paint and use his speed as an advantage against opposing defenses. I think the most disappointing part about Max Christie and Gabe Vincent is, is the fact that they were touted as two of the main difference makers for this team this upcoming season. Outside of getting Jared Vanderbilt back, Max Christie and Gabe Vincent were touted all offseason as the poster boys for internal improvement. They were supposed to be the difference between this season and last season and why the Lakers didn't make any moves this offseason because they wanted to see what a healthy Gabe Vincent looked like. They wanted to see what Max Christie with a more consistent role looked like. And so far through seven games, they have both 
fallen flat on their faces and the front office looks foolish for relying on them. And Max Christie and Gabe Vincent have done nothing to make this team look better. In fact, all they've done so far is make the Lakers cupboard of assets look infinitely worse. Because who's going to take Gabe Vincent's remaining $22 million for the next two years? And does anybody want Max Christie's $32 million contract over the next three years? Right now, I would probably say no. And so, yeah, I don't know. I guess we just have to pray that Max Christie finds his confidence and Gabe Vincent can regain some of his Miami Heat confidence and actually knock down a catch and shoot three. But yeah, this can't keep happening. And I think Rob Palenka may need to swing a marginal trade sooner rather than later to get this team some help on both ends of the court. Because Anthony Davis is already falling apart and LeBron James is looking more and more like he's about to turn 40 years old and we need help on both ends of the floor. And so this brings me to my third and last point of the night. And I think it's actually a pretty underrated topic that not many people are talking about. But I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but the Lakers have not been consistently good offensively. The Lakers being bad defensively without Jared Vanderbilt to start this season off is quite an unremarkable statement and shouldn't be some sort of new revelation. But the Lakers being this inconsistent offensively is not something that I particularly anticipated. Coming into this season with J.J. Redick and all of the new sets that he's been implementing, all of the new pretty motion and off-ball screening, we all figured that the Lakers would have to lean into their offense, spacing, and execution. But through seven games of this season thus far, the shooting, the execution, the turnovers, the offense has been very inconsistent. And obviously the lack of bench scoring and bench depth has only exacerbated that issue. But I think the Lakers being bad offensively to start this season off has actually been one of the more underrated talking points of this early part of the season. Tonight, the Lakers only shot 43% of the field. They were 9 of 25 from 3, 36%. It's okay. But outside of Anthony Davis, who has looked phenomenal offensively and I believe has had five out of seven games where he's scored 30 plus points or more, he had another 37 points tonight. Outside of Anthony Davis, everybody else has been very inconsistent. D'Angelo Russell had 19 points on Friday versus Toronto, but then reverted back to only 11 points tonight. He did shoot, I think, a season-high 14 shots tonight. Yeah, D'Angelo Russell actually shot the most he's ever shot in a single game this season with 14 shots. He just could not hit his paint shots tonight. Austin Reeves was 7 of 17 from the field, 3 of 10 from 3. Some of his shot selection from downtown left a lot to be desired. And after starting off the year pretty hot from three-point land, since his 5 of 9 from 3 game versus the Phoenix Suns, Austin Reeves is now, let's see, he was 1 of 4, 0 of 6, and then 3 of 10 tonight. Fast math, that is... Austin Reeves is 4 of 20 from three-point land in his last three games, so 420, he has not been too high from three-point land, but he has been high in another way, I guess, 420. Um, and then Rui Hachimura only had eight points tonight. He was two of six from the field. He has been less involved in the offense, and I think he has allowed that to trickle into his defensive activity and motor. And... Rui just kind of looked like a mess tonight. He was all over the place. He was moving too quickly, driving the ball with his head down with no real purpose and intent. And yeah, LeBron James, 7 of 16. He's not even shooting that efficiently from the field as well. Only 20 points tonight. And so outside of Anthony Davis, this team has been very inconsistent offensively. Now, in Friday's game versus Toronto, four out of their five starters had 19 plus points or more. So that kind of shows you their offensive ceiling but on a night-to-night -night basis a lot of these guys are ping-ponging back and forth between having good and bad offensive games outside of Anthony Davis and when your bench is consistently giving you single-digit performances collectively we need all of our starters to score at least 16 plus points and do it efficiently on most nights if we're going to be this porous defensively especially in transition. But yeah, we need D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves to consistently shoot better from three. And we just need some sort of offensive juice and life to come off of that bench outside of just Dalton Connect. But right now, there's really nowhere else to turn. Who are we, who are we going to go to? JHS? Maxwell Lewis? Honestly, we may need to turn to Quincy Oliveri for some of that offensive juice if we don't do something soon. 
And again, maybe the answer is for Rob Palenka to actually make a consolidation trade, even if it is a smaller marginal move. And I think right now the deal that I would try and do would be to go to the Charlotte Hornets and see if they would take on Jackson Hayes, JHS, and three seconds, or maybe even four seconds, see if they will take that package and give us Nick Richards. Because I feel like Nick Richards would take a lot of pressure and burden off of Anthony Davis. And then it also helps consolidate some roster spots. It helps open up a roster spot if we ship out Jackson Hayes and JHS and only take back one player. And with that open roster spot, we can then go out there and sign either another point of attack wing defender or sign an athletic guard who can also primary create for himself and others as well. Guards like Markel Fultz, Dennis Smith Jr., or former Laker Lonnie Walker. These are all free agents out there right now looking for an NBA job. And so if Rob Palenka can please call up the Charlotte Hornets, ship out JHS Jackson Hayes three seconds for Nick Richards, and then sign one of these athletic guards, I think that would go a long way in helping the Lakers stem the tide in Jared Vanderbilt and Christian Wood's absence. Two players who we cannot seem to get an adequate, clear answer on what their timelines look like moving forward. But with that said, that will do it for my post-game recap of the Detroit Pistons game. It was just a poor effort from the Lakers all around, but at the same time, they just don't have the horses to keep up with an athletic and physical and young team like the Detroit Pistons. The only way the Lakers can beat these more athletic and physical and younger teams is to outsmart them and out-execute them. They need to be on their P's and Q's when it comes to running their sets and trusting their process and taking care of the ball. But tonight, they were pretty sloppy and they were pretty flat-footed. They were on their heels for much of the night in transition. And yeah, this is the result we get. The Detroit Pistons had complete control of the game for about 95% of the game, and I believe it was almost a wire-to-wire -wire victory for the Detroit Pistons. The 3-5 and five Detroit Pistons. Um, but yeah, give a lot of credit to the Detroit Pistons and Cade Cunningham. They are playing a lot better this year under their new head coach. And yeah, the Lakers just need to regroup and find a way to, as J.J. Redick said, have some pride defensively to start off these games. All right, that'll do it for this rambling post-game recap. Let me know if you guys enjoyed that at all, and I might do more of them in the future if I have time. But with that said, that'll do it. Uh, please remember to like this video, comment down below, and most importantly, please subscribe to this channel. Um, yeah, I should have a podcast up tomorrow night. Uh, me and Tommy are going to talk about the last few games in this road trip. Um, but yeah, with that said, thank you guys for watching. This has been Jonathan Hernandez of the Lakers Legacy Podcast, and hopefully the next time I talk to you guys, the Lakers will have won a couple of games again. All right, peace.